Good morning. We're here today with Judge Webster Kia. Len, always good to see you. It is. Right back to you, Judge. I'm happy that you're here and helping us out with this project. Sure. It's really important. Um, with these interviews, I like to start at the beginning. So, can you tell us about your beginning, where you were from? And well, born and raised in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. as my parents were. Okay. I had uh, three brothers, uh, one sister, oh, yeah. and uh, we grew up in uh, Holy Child Parish, which is up in the area of Central High School and LaSalle College, mm -hmm. just off of uh, Somerville and uh, Sydenham Street. Okay. Which People don't know, it's between 15th and 16th Street. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I uh, went to grade school there, Holy Child, um, St. Joe's Prep, and uh, then LaSalle College, which is now university. Mm -hmm. And I did law school in Georgia, Mercer University. Okay. And what did you do before you became a judge? You practiced law? <clears throat> um, well, yeah, we just, uh, started off in the, uh, in the DA's office in 71 out of law school. Okay. It was a uh, rather interesting class. It was a large class. Yeah. And uh, when we all joined the DA's office, uh, our inspector was the DA. Dick Sprague was the first assistant. Yeah. A couple of the employees that were there at the time were uh, people you may recognize, uh, Ed Rendell. <laughs> Lynn Abraham. Okay. And uh, our class had some uh, noteworthy uh, admittees. Oh, yeah. Like? Uh, well, we had Cliff Haynes, who went on to become, oh. become the chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar and the president of the Pennsylvania Bar. Okay. Uh, Mike Stiles, who went on to become a judge, then mm -hmm. the U.S. attorney, and then uh, finally vice president of the Phillies, mm -hmm. which he probably enjoyed more than those other jobs. <laughs> Uh, who else was there? Well, we also had Jim Collins. We called him Jumbo back in those days. Yeah. And uh, Bonnie Ledbetter, both of whom uh, went to uh, Commonwealth Court, Pennsylvania. Okay. Right. And then, of course, uh, Ryan Castile, who went on to become Chief Justice of Pennsylvania. So uh, that is an interesting. A lot class. of luminaries in that yeah. class. Well, including yourself. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm at the very tail end of that. <laughs> so, you moved from the DA's office eventually. Yes. To the bench. How did that happen? Um, when uh, Ed Rendell came in, I, I left the DA's office and I uh, practiced with uh, Emmett Fitzpatrick. Okay. Uh, I had been uh, his executive deputy for a while. And, in the uh, DA's office. Yeah. We yeah. Shared, uh, shared office space. And then um, uh, he moved down close to the federal court where he did most of his work and I, I maintained an office and practice uh, right here in Center City. Mm -hmm. and, uh, did that for 13 years, uh, doing criminal defense, civil, mostly for plaintiffs, okay. uh, federal and state court and uh, superior court, Supreme Court appeals. Wow. Uh, back in those days, if you had any homicide case, went on appeal, it all went to the Supreme Court. Okay. It was, right. it was like automatic. So was was, first, uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, did that for 13 years, and then uh, there was an opening in 91. Um, and I was appointed by uh, Governor Casey in uh, December, well, November, and I was sworn in in December of 91. All right. And uh, were there other people appointed? Was that, that a large group of people that were appointed at, this, at the same time? Uh, there, were, there was just, um, just a couple okay. uh, at, 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 at that point. All right. Now, so uh, where did you start your judicial career? <clears throat> well, um, I was assigned to the trial division, and I, I started off um, hearing uh, jury demand cases, mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then did waivers, and from 91 to 96, um, I did about uh, 2,000 criminal trials, wow. waiver trials, and then uh, 96, uh, they began a section leader uh, program, so I was appointed uh, one of the section leaders mm -hmm. in 96. And then uh, 98 to 2000, I did uh, mixed homicide in uh, major felony cases. Hmm. Sounds like a heavy load. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no lack of inventory, as, okay. as the saying goes. <laughs> and then uh, 2000, I went over to uh, civil doing major... Uh, major jury uh, civil cases for a year Okay. until um, 2001 
where I came back, I was appointed supervising judge of criminal. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I remember. Well, I remember earlier in your mm -hmm. career, too, when we knew each first met each other. Um, what do you, do you think that, that the practice of law has changed a lot over the years from when you began <clears throat> to how it is now? Uh, it, incredibly so. Um, in 71, when we were young DAs, we would uh, battle during the day with uh, public defenders and defense counsel and then uh, meet up with them afterwards for a happy hour at uh, Frankie Clements or uh, some other establishment. I remember that place, and, yeah. And uh, it, was, it was cordial, it was more collegial. Um, you know, we would uh, represent our clients, uh, me as the, you know, representing the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and, mm -hmm. and the other lawyers as their individual clients. Right. But we didn't harbor any ill will. It, it was it was more a lot more civil. Yeah. And um, even when I was in private practice after the DA's office, yeah, uh, it was more civil. You could uh, take people at their word. If you had a phone conversation and they said, "Yeah, I'll grant you an extension to file whatever you need to file," mm -hmm. uh, you didn't get an email at uh, at midnight. Uh, Where's your file? Disclaiming <laughs> that that conversation ever took place. You know? Okay. So. Uh, it really became more more of a business, and I think all you know all the judges that have been on the bench for a while, yeah. and lawyers that have been in practice for a while, recognize that it, mm -hmm. it uh, um, got to be more of a business than, than a profession. It's not you're not the first person to talk about the collegiality between. No, I'm I'm sure not. It's, yeah. uh, it's and, pretty apparent. And the lack of it today, if. Uh, if uh, you had to, or yeah, well, if you had to give advice to new judges today, mm -hmm. coming up, what would you tell them? <clears throat> well, when I was a supervising judge, I, I would I would greet uh, the new judges co coming into uh, coming into criminal, and as administrative judge, I greet all the all the new judges as well, and. Um, to try to have them avoid the uh, black robe fever mm -hmm. uh, that uh, some uh, fall into, I, I would tell them that um, this is likely the most important job that you will that you will have. Okay. But if you need this job to be important, uh, you never will be. <laughs> it's an and important then, distinction. And then I tell them, well, you know, I was assistant DA, you know. Senior trial attorney, ex executive deputy, had my own firm. Uh, I was a company commander of Common Engineers, 103rd okay. Engineer Battalion. Um, and all those things that I did, I felt were important. Mm -hmm. And when I became a judge, it was just a transition. I, I didn't become a judge to be important. I yeah. already, already felt, felt qualified. Right. So. Um, don't have the black robe fever. Just right. you know, try to do your job and, and be cordial and respectful to people that appear in front of you. That's a, I think that's great advice yeah. and uh, uh, needed today too. Uh, now you mentioned two things. You mentioned your time, or at least you touched on the fact that you were an administrative judge and then that you were a company commander. So can you tell me also a little bit about your administrative judge position? <clears throat> Well, I actually spent more time as the supervising judge okay. of, of criminal, and uh, one of the main projects uh, that I focused on was video conferencing, mm -hmm. video oh. hearings. Um, when I took over, there was probably only I don't know, maybe a hundred or so video hearings a year, mm -hmm. and the technology was was just becoming a regular course. Yeah. So with the help of uh, courtroom operations, in particular Mike Spaziano and, and his right. team, we really expanded that to um, uh, where they do, I think, a couple thousand a year now, which uh, saves transportation. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it uh, speeds things up. Uh, there were times where we couldn't um, get a bring down for somebody from a state prison yeah. way out west for a 10 minute hearing. Mm. It might take months to get a bring down. To find a spot here, and then a few days to transport and right. transport back, and the expense and the sheriff's personnel, and right. 
So we uh, really uh, went forward and um, did a lot of video conferencing, which you could schedule in a matter of days or a couple of weeks instead of waiting months for somebody to um, have some resolution on, on their case, particularly like uh, PCRA cases, post-conviction relief act cases, mm -hmm. and things of that sort. Um, we also, uh, during that time, we also established the state's first uh, gun court mm -hmm. and um, the adult probation and parole risk-based assessment uh, model Very important. also came, came into That's play cool. at that point. Yeah. And uh, then uh, in uh, April of uh, 2007 is when I was appointed as the administrative judge. Okay. And uh, that was uh, an exciting time. Um, there were many developments that were that were coming into play, and it wasn't it wasn't me designing it, but I was I was honored to to be there when uh, a couple important things came into play. Um, we had the mental health court uh, begin with uh, Judge Sheila Wood Skipper, now President Judge, in charge of that. Uh, we also did the uh, residential foreclosure um, diversion program. Oh, right with uh, um, Judge Rizzo. And you kept, in that way, you kept people in their homes and the, the lenders were negotiating with the families or with yeah, the counselors. Yeah, there, there was actually a point where people could sit down and, and speak to one another instead of just uh, mm -hmm. rattling papers and filing things back and forth. That, that same summer, uh, we launched um, civil e-filing, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, obviously was a real game changer. And uh, shortly after that, we, we started the initial stages, uh, planning stages of uh, criminal e-filing. And um, we also moved uh, to zone court, uh, which is the way uh, cases are, are, are still heard. Right, okay. And with the DA assigning a certain uh, <clears throat> member of his staff to uh, deal with an individual zone of the city. Right, exactly. Okay. And that, that helped in a number of ways. Instead of um, the officers who were uh, called to testify, instead of having to appear on uh, two or three different floors and uh, being tied up all their cases, because it's the same zone, they would be on the same floor. So yeah. uh, it, it just made, made sense from a logistical sure. standpoint. Yeah. yeah, I think it's worked. Uh, yeah, I yeah. believe so. Well, uh, all those things that you mentioned are, are, are pretty significant, are very significant accomplishments, I think. And I thank you for being part of them. Was there anybody you looked up to in, in, when you were younger, or anybody who you can think of in your mind who was maybe uh, you know, a, a symbol of the law, or maybe even that helped you? Uh, proceed throughout your career. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I remember being in the uh, in the DA's office. I, you know, I appeared before a number of judges. Uh, Judge McDermott, who went on to become uh, Justice McDermott, uh, mm -hmm. did a number of cases with him. I'm always impressed with uh, with his style. Uh, Norm Jenkins was a a great guy. Yeah. Alex Bonavita Cole, when he was just a trial judge before he became uh, president, uh, president judge and administrative judge, right. yeah. any number of judges, uh, they were uh, they were a good a good core. Judge Malmed, uh, I could I could go on and on. Yeah, and they were all uh, they were all inspiring in in different ways. Okay, and uh, it was always a pleasant experience. Yeah, that's. And that's a wonderful thing, I think, when everybody cooks, treats each other well, and everything drives along mm -hmm. toward, toward the resolution of the case. Well, it, it also instills public confidence for those in the courtroom where they see people being treated with respect. Right. Uh, both to the court and the court to the participants in trials. So. It's an important factor. I believe so. Yeah. Um, is there uh, anything else that you want to talk to us about? Have I left anything out? Uh, I don't know, Len. Talk I know you had, were going for the Mr. Universe uh, title at one time, but... 
Sure. Uh, you know, speaking about oneself is uh, almost as embarrassing as that <laughs> as the first uh, uh, group shower that you have to go through in high school after after gym class. So I'm not all that comfortable talking about myself. I know. I know. But, but uh, it's fine. But, yeah, as the uh, um, the, the one accomplishment that I was uh, I was surprised by, mm -hmm. uh, but very honored by, in uh, July of uh, 2011, I was recognized by the Pennsylvania Conference of uh, State Trial Judges mm -hmm. and uh, awarded the uh, Golden Crowbar, uh, which is symbolic for uh, moving things along and uh, getting getting things done. Right. And, and they don't do it every year, uh, so I was. I was at the uh, conference and uh, surprised uh, that I had been nominated. Surprised yeah. that I won. So uh, yeah. Yeah. that was uh, that was a treat. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I've seen that award before, mm -hmm. and uh, and I was also um, while I was administrative judge had the opportunity to go to uh, Boston for the uh, uh, what was that national uh, court management oh. uh, meeting okay. and when uh, the. Uh, Foreclosure Diversion Program was awarded their national honor. Uh -huh. So I was uh, just uh, very honored to represent the First Judicial District in, in accepting that award uh, on behalf of that. It's a that beautiful program. program. Yeah. It's just a wonderful program. Really Instead is. of people being heartbroken and eventually out on the street, mm -hmm. they're actually accomplishing something. And, and it, it also set the model for other programs across the country. So oh, that. Uh, it was. Uh, it was really a, a monumental, a monumental program. Yeah. yeah, it's still going on, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I know it's difficult for you to you to talk about things, and I know that beside the Golden Crowbar Award, you've gotten many, many, many other awards and, and commendations. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I put you in a hard place. <laughs> Well, that, that's but, your job. Yeah, I guess it is. I try to make these things go a little more smoothly, but um, I just want to tell you thanks a lot for coming down today. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. Uh, it's good to see you again. Len, always good to see you. And uh, we, you've done a great job. I'm glad you still have something to do. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All the best.